Hey everybody, it's Mr. Doyle coming to you live from Hudson Vote Tech. Actually, it feels great to be back in the classroom. Uh, so listen, we've talked a lot about demand, supply, and equilibrium the past you know week or so in economics. And I can see that some of you uh, are really getting it, and some of you might need a little bit more help. And folks, that's perfectly fine. I still get confused with stuff like this sometimes. And so I really want to, to give you this video to just really go over everything one more time in one big old place just talking about our market forces and how they work with each other because remember our essential question is how do markets operate and understanding demand supply and equilibrium is the really big way in how we understand how markets operate okay so what I wanted to do is I wanted to briefly go over demand briefly go over supply talk a little bit about equilibrium and then we'll look at how these things could actually work okay so let's start with demand so we know that demand is the desire ability and the willingness to purchase something but it's also uh, used to measure how much of something people want at each specific price point right and we show that on our demand curve which we have right here Right, it's our downward sloping curve to show that as price goes down, the quantity demanded goes down. Right? And so we can see at every single price point on the curve, we know how many uh, goods or services people want at those prices right, within that market. And we talked about how this curve only measures prices and quantities but because people are fickle and because markets change this demand curve will move from time to time right so it will shift to the right or to the left and we want to know what are the things that will shift it well we have our determinants of demand so remember our helpful way to remember that is timer to help us remember what our shifters or our determinants of demand are. And folks, if you do not know those yet, you really need to bite the bullet and just take 10, 15 minutes, make note cards, memorize what they are, right? You gotta know your determinants. So our determinants, we have taste, right? Which is uh, consumer preferences or fads. What are people into right now? A perfect example of taste is Among Us, the, the new mobile game for your phone kind of came out of nowhere and now people love it, right? So the demand for Among Us costumes for Halloween, Among Us merchandise, so t-shirts, things like that, has gone way up because it's super duper popular right now, right? So that's taste. Next is a change in income. So if people are making more money, they're gonna be more likely to go out and spend money on things. Right? And so that means their demand for certain things is going to increase. So last week when they went to the movies, they didn't want to buy popcorn and pretzels. Right? But now that they're making more money, their demand for popcorn has increased. Next we have the members of the population, uh, or a change in the members of the population. So if more people move into an area, the demand for things is naturally going to increase. I like to think about this, it's like the beach around Memorial Day. Tons of people show up to the beach on Memorial Day, so demand for everything goes up. Spots at restaurants, things at the grocery store, things at the drugstore. Everything's naturally going to go up because there's way more people. Next, we have consumer expectations. And this is what we, because we're consumers, we're the ones who buy things, what we think is going to happen, right? And what is going to happen to demand because of that. The way I like to think about this, I like to think about it uh, it's like when your parents talk to you about your Christmas list, right? When you're like, mom, can I have money for new shoes? And like, put it on your Christmas list or uh, we're going to wait and, and buy this on Black Friday when things are cheaper, right? So when you expect things to be either higher in price or lower in price, you behave predictably. So when you have those expectations, demand is going to move. So if you expect something to be more expensive tomorrow, your demand for it today will increase. Right? So if you expect those shoes are going to be more expensive after Black Friday, well, your demand before Black Friday is going to increase. Likewise, if you think it's going to be cheaper after the holiday season, your demand for it right now will go down because you want to buy it later when it's cheaper. Right? All right, and next we have the price of related goods. 
uh, or a change in the price of related goods. So there's two ways we see this work out. There's substitute goods, which are goods that can replace each other. I like to think about this with soda, right? So Coke and Pepsi are substitute goods, or Coke, Pepsi, RC, Cola, all of those things, they can replace each other. Dr. Pe uh, Dr. Pepper and Mr. Pibb, you can replace them. Right? So they satisfy the same desires. So if the cost of Dr. Pepper goes up, the demand for Dr. Pepper is going to drop because people are going to go buy Mr. Pibb because it's cheaper. So the demand for Mr. Pibb will go up and the demand for Dr. Pepper will go down. Now the other way we see related goods work are uh, goods that are uh, complementary or that go with each other, right? So peanut butter and jelly. If the price of peanut butter goes up, the demand for jelly and peanut butter both will go down, right? Or chips and salsa. If the price for salsa goes up, the demand for tortilla chips is going to go down. And so those are our shifters of demand. Right? And we also have this note down here that says price and quantity demanded. A lot of you are going to get tripped up by this and you keep thinking that when price changes something happens to demand. It doesn't. right? Nothing happens to demand in that scenario. The only thing that happens is it's a change in the quantity demanded. It's a change along this curve right here. So if it used to be eight bucks but now it's five bucks, the only thing that's happened is now we want 16 instead of eight. Right? We only want more because the price has gone down. We don't need to move the, the, the curve. The curve is still doing its job. Right? Because if the price were to go back up to eight, we would still only want eight. Right? So that's how that's going to work. Let's go ahead and talk about the supply side and then we'll start doing some practice. Okay? So with supply, I'm going to shift this way. We know that supply is how much of a good producers have and are willing and able to sell in the market, right? Uh, and we know that we use the supply curve to measure that, right? And it's upward sloping because it shows that when the price goes up, producers want to sell more, right? Uh, we, we see every single price and every single quantity that could prevail in the market. Right? And just like with demand, we're going to see that supply has some shifters, right? Because that curve measures, sorry, upward, that upward curve measures what's going on right now, but supply changes just like demand changes. Things act on supply that make the market behave predictably. And the things that will change supply are, there are six of them, and we use tigers to help us remember that. Right, and so the first is technology. So advances in technology will increase supply. If there is more available technology or technology gets better, uh, supply will increase. Right? If you think about it, during this COVID-19 pandemic, if we didn't have Chromebooks and laptops, the supply of uh, assignments and educational material would have plummeted. But because we have Chromebooks, it has gone up. Okay. Next is the cost of inputs. So the inputs are the things that go into making a good or a service, right? So Chick-fil-A sandwich, you need bread, lettuce, tomato, pickles, chicken, right? If the cost of any of those five things changes, supply will change. So if it becomes more expensive to purchase chicken, it's now more expensive to make that Chick-fil-A sandwich. Producers are going to make less, supply goes down. Next is a, a change in government subsidies. Government subsidies. Remember, a subsidy is when the government will provide you money uh, to, to do something for them. Right? They will give you money to, a lot of the time we see with farmers, they're, hey, grow a bunch of corn so we can use it to make ethanol, which we use for gasoline. And so whenever we see a government subsidy, if it's handled correctly by the recipient, so by the farmer, uh, we're going to see supply increase. Right? Very rarely, almost never, will we see a government subsidy result in a decrease in supply. Next, we have producer expectations. And this you got to think like a business owner here. When producers think that things are going to change, they behave predictably. So if they think that people are going to pay more for their good or service tomorrow, right, they're going to 
decrease the supply today. They're going to make less today because they want to sell tomorrow when the price is high. Likewise, if they think the price is going to go down tomorrow, they want to produce as much today so that they can sell while the price is still high. Right, so if we stick with that idea of a Chick-fil-A sandwich, they're going to pump out as many Chick-fil-A sandwiches today so they can sell them while the price is high before it goes down tomorrow. Okay? So you got to think like a business owner there. It's kind of the opposite of consumer expectations. Right? That's easy for us to think about because we're consumers. We got to think like we're running a business. Okay? All right, next is government regulation and taxes. So when there are regulations or taxes, it's always going to be a decrease in supply. That's the government taking money from a business, uh, making it harder for them to do their job, to make their good or service. Supply is naturally going to decrease. It's just how it is. Okay. Then our last shifter of supply is the number of suppliers. And this one, if there are more people making the good or the service, the supply is naturally going to go up. If there are less people, it's naturally going to go down. That's how it is. Um, I like to think about this, you know, why are there five Starbucks on this block? It's like, well, because the supply of coffee needs to be that high. If they close one of those Starbucks, supply is going to go down. doesn't mean Starbucks is going out of business. It just means there's less coffee than there used to be. We also have this idea about price and quantity supplied. So just like with demand, price is not enough to shift supply. The only thing that happens when price changes is producers want to make more or less, right? So if we test this at $4, right, producers only want to make eight. But if the price were to shoot up to, let's say, 10, producers would want to make closer to 20, right? Nothing has changed because if the price falls back to, to four, they're going to go back to making eight. Nothing has changed. Right? The only thing that has changed is the number or the quantity suppliers want to make has increased or decreased. Make sure you, you think about that. Okay. Now let's talk about equilibrium. Equilibrium is that perfect sweet spot in the middle. X marks the spot right here. where supply and demand are equal, right? Just think about it, it's the old Wakanda forever, right? I'm trying to stay relevant. Uh, but equilibrium is that spot in the middle. And the thing about that spot in the middle and why it's so important for us to understand equilibrium and why we're really looking at it is because the market strives to be here, right? This is where the market wants to be all the time because this is the best place for it to be. Because if you look at it, this is where supply and demand come together, and that means there's no waste. It's the most efficient spot. So at $6, right, people, if we measure demand, the quantity demanded is going to be 14, right? So let's say it's, it's pizzas, right? So at 6 bucks, people want 14 slices of pizza. Great. Let's check the producer side. At $6, suppliers want to make 14. That's fantastic. Everybody who wants a slice of pizza gets a slice of pizza and the producer gets to sell all of the pizza they're willing to sell. right? Because if they weren't at that spot, they would either have extra pizza that they aren't going to make money off of or they would have consumers going home upset because they didn't get pizza. Right? And we can test that. So if a supplier were to raise the price from $6 to $8, right, we would follow our curve, follow our curve from eight, so we hit the demand curve. People want eight slices of pizza when they're eight bucks, okay? But producers want to make 18 slices of pizza. And the problem with that is they now have 10 extra slices of pizza that they aren't going to make any money off of, right? It's going to go into the trash, or maybe they'll donate it. I don't know. Whatever, whatever you need to think to sleep at night. But that, that's not efficient, right? That's inputs they wasted, resources they used, money they had to spend for that, and money they're not going to make back. So operating outside of equilibrium is bad because it could result in a surplus. Or if they lowered the price too much, let's say they lowered it to 
Well, suppliers would only want to make eight, but people would want 18. So that means you're sending 14 people home without pizza, and you're not gonna make enough money that way, and people aren't gonna support your business anymore. It's not good, it's not good. So you always, always, always wanna be striving to be at equilibrium so that the producers and the consumers are both happy and there is no waste because we know that our resources are very precious. Right? Now, let's, let's do an example. Let's talk about this. All right, let's, do, let's do an example. Let's go with, let's go with candy. All right, let's, let's say we're gonna look at the market for Skittles, okay? Mr. Doyle really likes Skittles, right? They're, they're a delicious candy. Um, taste the rainbow, right? That's the thing. So we're gonna look at the market for Skittles, and I'll write that up here. That, that's what we're gonna look at. Skittles market, okay. So let's say this is our market for Skittles. Uh, we know our equilibrium price is six, our equilibrium quantity is 14, everybody's happy, okay? Now, we're all enjoying our Skittles, right? But let's say we go to the candy store and we see that Jolly Ranchers have just gone down in price, right? So Jolly Ranchers used to be five bucks a bag, now they're three bucks a bag. Well, because Skittles and Jolly Ranchers are similar goods, they're related goods. Uh, they, they aren't exactly substitute goods, but they are, you know, sweet candies, right? And for the sake of the argument, we're going to say that they're substitute goods. The price of Jolly Ranchers coming down is going to change the demand for Skittles. So because Jolly Ranchers are now cheaper, the demand for Skittles is going to decrease. And so we should remember that when we decrease, we shift to the left, right? So we should remember Ertl, Ertl, right? So we shift to the left. So we would have to draw our new curve. And we see now that at every single price point, people want less than they used to because the price of Jolly Ranchers has gone down. So demand has shifted. Uh, and if we wanted to put that to the test, we could. Because at eight, we used to want, well, let's just, let's check our old equilibrium. Right at six bucks, people used to want 14, but now at six bucks, people only want eight. Right, so we know we're operating outside of efficiency now, and we know that at every price point, things have changed. So, one of the things we have to do now is determine what our new equilibrium is. Right, because if we keep trying to sell, at six dollars, well, we are not gonna be in equilibrium. We're gonna have a serious problem because if we keep operating at six, people are gonna want eight, right? But at six dollars, suppliers wanna make 14, right? So there's gonna be a surplus, it's too much. We can't have that. So we need to find our new equilibrium, which would be right here where demand and supply meet. All right, so that whole X marks the spot. Then we have equilibrium quantity one and equilibrium price one, which looks like it's about $5 and 10 packets of Skittles, right? So we see that both of them went down. And so in order to get back to equilibrium, uh, the makers of Skittles would need to rate to, would need to lower their price to five so that producers would only make 10. So that way there's a balance again, everything's back to normal. But let's look at the supplier side, right? So what would happen if there was a shift in supply? Well, let's stick with our, our Skittles market, okay? We'll, we'll stick with Skittles because who doesn't love Skittles, right? We'll go with... Hmm, Let's say inputs. We'll go. We'll, we'll say there's a change in inputs. So let's say that the cost of sugar has decreased immensely. Right? Sugar used to be a dollar a pound. Now it's ten cents a pound. Sugar is the primary ingredient in Skittles, and so if the cost of that input has gone down, 
that much, the supply of Skittles is going to go up. Producers are going to make more because it's now cheaper to make Skittles. And so when there is an increase in supply, we still use Ertl. So we know we need to shift to the right. So we make a whole new curve because at every single price point, suppliers want to make more than they used to. And now we can keep testing that thought, right? Because our old supply curve should, oh, I drew a demand curve. See, I told you Mr. Doyle gets confused by this stuff sometimes still, right? I got demand on the brain. got demand on the brain and I shifted incorrectly so I want to shift my supply curve to the right so I would want to draw it like that that is a much better supply curve right so now that I've shifted my supply curve to the right I want to check and see if that theory is correct where every single price is changed well at one producers used to want to make two but now they want to make 12 at two they used to want to make four but now they want to make 14 I'm not going to go through and do every one of these, but we can see that the price point, uh, every single price point has changed. Producers want to make more because of that decrease in input costs. We also need to check on equilibrium, right? Because we can't operate here anymore. Supply has changed, right? So we need to come over here and check what our new equilibrium is. And we're going to label this equilibrium quantity 2 and equilibrium price 2. It's very important that you have a detailed label on all your stuff so you don't get lost. Because the first thing we did was, to, was natural. Uh, the second thing we did, so EP1 was demand, and EP2 and EQ2 show us what happened when there was a shift in supply. So our new equilibrium is right here. So it's four dollars uh, and 18 packets of Skittles. So we can see that the shift in supply led to a drop in price and an increase in quantity. Right, so when supply and demand change, equilibrium changes along with it. Okay. Now, we could put that to the test with just about anything. Right, we could do it with the opposite, we could do it with Jolly Ranchers. Any good or service you can think of, you're going to be able to do this too, right? But let's do one more thing that I want to make sure we all understand. And that's what is going to happen when there is change in price alone. And I know I've talked about that with you all already today, but it's very important we understand it. So we have our supply and demand curve, right? And we have our equilibrium. Now let's say the only thing that happens is that producers drop the price of Skittles from $6, which is our equilibrium, they drop the price from $6 to $4. Nothing is going to shift. I'll show you what this looks like. So when, it sh when we went from $6 down to $4, the only thing that changes is how much we want or how much producers want to supply. So we used to be right here, but now Suppliers are here, demand is here. So producers used to want to make 14, now they want to make eight. Consumers used to want 14, now they want 18. Right? And we can test this further and further and further. So let's say they want to bring it down to $3. Well, they only want $6, or they only want to make six, but people want 20. If they dropped it to two, People would demand 22, but producers would only want to make four. And it works the same if there's an increase. So if we increase to $7, suppliers want to make 16, consumers only want 12. If it's $8, uh, 
Uh, $8. Consumers only want eight, but suppliers want to make 18. So we see the only thing that changes when price changes is the quantity supplied or demanded, right? And we also, hopefully that helps us to see why equilibrium is so efficient because when we lower the price or raise the price above equilibrium, we see some issues, right? There's gonna be shortages or surpluses, right? And remember, when supply or demand shifts, every single price point shifts along with it, right? So if this curve were to go this way, if the supply curve were to shift, ooh, that's a dead marker. If the supply curve were to shift to the right, well, now we can see every single price point has shifted with it with a new quantity, okay? So I really hope that this video helped you to understand a little bit better. Um, hopefully I didn't make you too hungry thinking about Skittles. Um, as always, ask questions. I know this stuff can be challenging, but I know you can do it, okay? Good luck.